Hi, this is Curtis Millsap with Millsap Farm. Today on our Twilight Walk, we're going to be talking about seed starting and transplants. So we're going to talk about the ins and outs of what you need to have on hand to have healthy seedlings and how to manage those, plan for health, and then get them out into the field without killing your plants. And Curtis, do you save any of your seeds or do you buy them all new? I don't think I've saved any seeds for several years. Uh, there was a variety of tomatoes we saved for a number of years, Mortgage Lifter, and we liked those, uh, but it was, uh, we kind of dropped the ball on it one year, and then we really backed away from growing most heirlooms, so uh, that was kind of a reason to stop that. Uh, but yeah, so, oh hey Shadrach, Shadrach is our cat dog, he's a dog <laughs> cat, he's not sure what he is. Yeah, they, that's, you get a crowd of cats, there's always one in there. Um, okay, so uh, I guess we'd close that door probably and cut the breeze. It's uh, yeah, chilly out there. Is that make it in? She made a left after the Okay, greenhouse. she'll catch up with us. Okay. All right. Maybe I shouldn't. Or maybe she won't. No, it's okay. She's, I mean, she can come in the door. It won't. It's, there's a latch on the Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so um, let's dig into seedling production. So uh, there are several things that we're going to talk about. But the, um, the general categories are uh, seed selection, um, uh, media, so where are we going to grow in, soil, potting soil, um, growing conditions, so there we'll talk about heat, heat, water, and light, and airflow, so those are the big four, and then we'll talk about hardening up. Okay. So, uh, so what we do, uh, in terms of seedling for seed production, um, we've been, over the years, kind of narrowing down our varieties, but at the same time, always kind of experimenting with new ones. So, so every year we usually, I would say every year, but most years we probably chuck one or two varieties out of the tomatoes or out of the whatevers, and we go, oh, let's try this and see if this is better, if we like some aspect of this better. So what would we like better? Well, for example, uh, in the case of tomatoes, you know, yield is a big question because tomatoes have a wide range. Um, you can grow these fabulous Cherokee purple tomatoes, right, with some of the best tasting tomatoes uh, that I know of, and yet the yield on those is really low. Uh, if you get 10 pounds off of a cherry tomato, off of a uh, Cherokee purple tomato plant, you're doing really well. Um, whereas if you grow Celebrity, which is a really nice big red slicer, but is a hybrid, not an heirloom, um, <clears throat> and has good flavor, is you can get like 25 to 30 pounds off of each plant. Um, so, you know, that's one of the guiding things. Of course, we're a market garden, and of course, if you're growing for your own food, then that's also a question too. Like, how much space can I get to the tomatoes? Um, and so there's that. Then, of course, it's also what is our niche? What are we what are we growing it for? So, you know, we don't want to grow a big red slicer if our niche is paste tomatoes and vice versa. Uh, we can sell a lot of cherry tomatoes. But we can't grow all cherry tomatoes because if we grew all the tomatoes we were going to grow in cherry tomatoes, we wouldn't be able to sell all of them. So we kind of reach these numbers in our plan that tells us uh, how many of each variety we need, or how many of each type. And then within that type, like slicers, for example, um, in a given year, we'll usually grow somewhere around 10 to 12 different types of tomatoes, slicer tomatoes. And the reason is, the reason for that, uh, that we would select those varieties would be... Uh, one, some of them may be suitable for different seasons. So early tomatoes, like early girl, or uh, all the mountain spring, mountain fresh, the whole mountain series, are really early, uh, smaller, but but uh, you know pretty decent tomatoes that can you can have tomatoes from those in May or June. Um, if you're planting them in a little bit of a cover or something, and certainly they'd be the first ones. Whenever you plant them, given everything else being equal, they would be the first ones that you would harvest. Um, but then those, the downside of those tomatoes is most of those don't do really well under heat. So when it gets really hot in the middle of the summer, those are going to drop off. You're going to lose production. So then we grow things like Cayman and um, Galahad, which are both heat-tolerant tomatoes. And so we want to have a succession of early tomatoes and we want to have a succession of later tomatoes. And we would choose different varieties for those reasons. Now, do you need to do that in a home garden? No, not necessarily. But one thing you want to be aware of is the difference between determinants and indeterminants. So determinants would be tomatoes that grow up and make a kind of a, I mean, they're going to still be big, but they're going to be more of a confined bush. 
so maybe they'll get like five foot tall uh, on a trellis system. And they'll kind of stop, or at least stall out. And they'll make all that fruit kind of all at once. So there's this big tidal wave of fruit. It's wonderful if you like to can. It's kind of a pain if you're trying to make salads, you know, because all of a sudden you've got all the tomatoes in the world. And then two weeks later, your tomato supply dwindles to a very slow trickle. On the other hand, if you grow indeterminate, so indeterminate meaning you know, it doesn't have a determined size, it's going to be a vine, an ongoing vine, then that will never stop growing, which means in the outside in the Ozarks, you've got a pretty long tomato season. You know, it could be, it'll be up and over your trellis and on to other things. And I've got friends who grow them on, um, oh, what he, I can't remember what he uses as trellis, but I had a friend who was picking tomatoes off of a ladder because they were just that <laughs> tall. You know, they get up 12 and 15 feet tall. Um, they don't have to get that tall. Obviously, they can let them flop over and go down, whatever. But but those two, those tomatoes do a better job of creating a continuous supply. You'll never have the glut. So if you're hoping to can, it might be kind of a pain because you're only going to get you know maybe a, a few tomatoes a day instead of like go out and pick a bushel of tomatoes. But if your goal is sandwiches and salads, then a few tomatoes a day is just perfect, and so you would want that. Uh, you want to hit see that you know, little bathroom sign through the sun, through the Two switches right behind it. If you turn those off, that fan will turn off and it will stop buzzing in my ears. Yeah, right there. Uh, other side of this. Uh, there you go. And it's the Yep. Oh, good job. Thank you. Oh, that's better. Um, so, so those are the reasons why we would choose a variety, for example. Um, in carrots, there's another sort of similar scenario where like, oh, do you want a quick early carrot, which may be smaller. But maybe you know it's only 60 days to maturity, or do you want to grow an 85-day carrot? But it's going to be a nice big carrot that you know will store really well. Um, and so there's there's choices like that that would guide us as we choose varieties. So you're thinking about what's your purpose for it, which which time is it going to operate, or which time we're going to grow it in, and um, and then how much space can I give to this? Which then kind of leads to that yield question, right? So for example, in the carrots, you know we like growing bolero carrots. They're our favorite carrot. They're a great big chunky carrot. They're really sweet. Um, they're a little slow because you know they're big. Um, but per square foot, yield per square foot blows anything else away because they get so big and nice. And so you know I can grow the little baby carrots and they're cute and they taste good. But if I'm going to grow a carrot and take all that trouble to weed it and care for it and water it and all that stuff that takes to grow good carrots, I just as soon grow something you know this long and this big around that still tastes <coughs> like that sugary baby carrot. So. So that's why we grow Bolero. Uh, but we do grow some early carrots. This is Laguna is one, and uh, Romance is another, that we seed in the very early season. And those grow just a little faster, so we can have some carrots from the field two or three weeks before we get to boil. So there you go. Um, so all that to say, seedling seed selection is part of that, right? Um, now the next thing we do is we make a plan. And these really are kind of concurrent processes, but we have a plan, and it's on a spreadsheet. And this is only a few columns in the spreadsheet. It's a really big spreadsheet. Um, and I think it has 400 rows and about, I don't know, maybe two dozen columns, something like that. But the key elements of any kind of seedling plan, it does not have to be anything like this complex. In fact, I can, I can pass this around a little bit if you want. Uh, you guys can. Pass around. I'm also glad to uh, to email this to anybody who wants to submerge yourself in the insanity. But it's uh, key elements of a of a seedling plan are uh, what are we growing? You know, what's the variety? What's the type or whatever it is? Um, how much are we growing? In our case, row feet is how we quantify that. Um, how are we going to space it? So how far apart are they going to go? Which kind of helps you understand how many plants you need. Which leads yeah leads to how many plants you need. And then the date, and I like to have two dates on there. I want the date, actually three dates. I want the date of harvest, I want the date of transplant, and I want the date to seed, moving backwards in time. And the reason I mentioned that backwards in time is because I want to know when I'm going to have these things, you know? I want to know when I'm going to have tomatoes. So if I set my date for the first tomatoes to be harvested in, um, in the first of, uh, middle of May, then backing that up to my transplant date, well, I need... Uh, I need about 60 days from transplant to harvest. And then looking back again, I need six weeks from seed to transplant. So I'm going to need about 12 to 13 weeks uh, from when I 
seed those to when I would hopefully maybe harvest the first cherry tomatoes. And so that means that I need to plant my, uh, if I want that mid-May date, then I need to plant my cherry tomatoes in February in the greenhouse and transplant them in March and so on. And on. So that's how, that, that's how that date thing works, is I've got you know, the, the seed date, the transplant date, and the harvest date. Um, and what else do I have on here that's pertinent? Uh, those, oh, the other thing that's going to be pertinent particularly today is where are we going to, or how are we going to grow those? So are we going to, uh, some stuff is direct seed, that's DS. Some things are going to be in a two inch block, some things are going to be in a smaller block, a one inch block, and some of those are going to be in uh, paper pot, trays, things like that. So we'll look at those. But, uh, so all that's part of the plan. How am I going to grow them? Where are they going to, uh, what sort of pot or container do they need? And then that helps me understand my needs in terms of uh, uh, space as well. So and we, we don't think about this as much as we used to because we've kind of settled into a pattern now and we don't change things too drastically. But initially, we really needed to know when we made a plan in the spring and the winter, how much space is it going to take to grow all these seedlings? How much greenhouse space do I have? So you got to think about that, right? Especially if you're growing in the house under lights. You know, you're only going to get so many trays under those lights and then you're going to have a problem, right? Um, so you're going to need more trays and lights or, or you've got to limit what you're growing. And so, uh, so that's a consideration in the plan. Um, then, uh, so we got a plan. Well, now we get out here and, and we need to have our, our, our um, all of our materials gathered. And so uh, we have uh, buckets of seeds. Um, let's see, Sarah was toting around a bucket earlier. But anyway, we use little, um, we store our, our seeds in buckets because they're airtight, moisture proof ish, you know. And, um, and so we'll have a, a bucket of tomato seeds and a bucket of carrot seeds and so on. So our seeds are gathered, we've ordered our seeds, and I, I've uh, got several seed catalogs out there on the front. Any of them that are duplicates, you're welcome to take one. Um, if not, you know, just write down the name. They'll be glad to send you five trillion catalogs. Uh, I mean, I'm, it's crazy. I don't understand the system, but I get a lot of catalogs. Um, but Johnny's is where I buy most of my seeds. Morgan County is where I buy most of the rest of my seeds. I also buy some from Osborne and occasionally some from Territorial. But uh, Johnny's is our primary uh, provider. And that's because they grow really high quality seeds. They are geared toward relatively small organic producers. And by relatively small, I mean not California scale. So anything under 20 acres would be considered small vegetable growing. Um, and they also have, uh, they've got a very good customer service department. So if I have a question and I call, I'm gonna get a human and they're gonna say, yep, we've grown that, this is what we think of that, or you might wanna try this instead for that condition and so on. So it's really nice to have a live person either in the line of cares whether your garden succeeds or not. So that's why I use Johnny's. Also, they have incredibly fast shipping. They're in Maine. And usually if I ship something, it'll be here in two days, or if I order something, which I think is phenomenal. I mean, I can't, I can't mail stuff down to my own parents in town in two days. I don't no. know how they do it. Um, so, got the seeds. Now, what are we going to put them in? Well, that's where we talk about media. So, media is potting soil. In our case, we buy potting soil in these big uh, super sacks, and we buy it from Morgan County, Morgan Composting. Not to be confused with Morgan County Seed. Different companies, different states. Uh, this is from uh, Michigan, and uh, it started out as a dairy farm that was looking for how do they get rid of all this manure, and they started composting it, and they went, hey, this stuff's pretty nice, and then uh, somebody started buying it from them, and they said, oh, that's worth something, and so then they started making uh, more compost, and before you knew it, they were kind of a composting facility with the collected dairy from all around them, and so that's what they do now, and then they produce these really high-quality potting soils, and we're really happy with it. Um, there's a catalog up on in there up front for them as well, but uh, we've tried a lot of different things. We used to mix our own uh, we've bought bag mixes off the shelf. There are some very good bag mixes. I really like um, um, Frog. What's it? Happy Frog. Is it? Yeah, it's a really nice one. I'm very happy with them. And we've also had uh, uh, good experiences with fo forest fox. Fo yeah, fox. Forest fox. Forest fox. Yeah. So both of those have been very good for us. But on our scale, you know, we would be buying pallets and pallets of that stuff, and they don't sell it in bulk. So we're very happy with these. Um, there are two different categories of mix in general. You've got a germination mix, which is a real fine mix. And so that's this right here. This is a 101. Um, and that's usually how they'll be delineated. The lower number will be a finer mix. 
And so you can see there's really not much of any sort of chunks in that. It's very small pieces. Um, and the reason for that is you want all your seeds to make good seed to soil contact. And we'll come back to that in a second. Then this is a, uh, this is still bagged up. Uh, potting soil would be this. So when you buy a potting soil, you expect it to have a little more texture, a little more chunks. Um, it usually have a little bit of bark in there, um, things like that that give it a little more aeration. It also will have a little more fertilizer. Um, too much fertilizer in a germination mix can cause your seeds to not germinate. So those of you who might have been having some germination problems, there's one place to look, is are you using potting soil or germination mix? Uh, germination mix typically has a very low uh, nutrient charge, we'd call it, so it has very little salt. And that's what's dangerous to the seeds, is that any fertilizer, organic or otherwise, has a certain amount of salt in it. Um, urea is a salt, and that's the nitrogen fertilizer usually. And so um, those, those things can kill your seeds, whereas uh, a, a germination mix will not have very much of that. The potting soil may have quite a bit more. Not always the case, but you know that would be something to look at, is what am I growing in, and, and is that part of the problem? So then, well, we don't want to grow them in a nutrient deficient thing the whole time, right? So we're going to use two media because this one's where we're going to start, and then we're going to move them to this if we're going to have them in, in, this, in the ground for very, or in the pots for very long. We're actually going to do what we call potting up. So we'll take them from this mix in a small cell or a small <coughs> block into this, maybe in a pot or something like that. And, um, and so certainly like tomatoes, for example, we would start in a soil block, which would be a I think, uh, Sarah, do you want to grab, well, maybe there's some right here. Um, yeah, these are sort of right. So these are soil blocks. Uh, these are uh, straw flowers. And these are germination mix. We use germination mix for this. And, um, and they're just a little bitty, you know, a little bitty block, right? And we make these with our block maker. Um, we, we used to have no. We used to have the small one. We got the big one a couple years back. Save us a lot of blocking. But uh, we mix up a really wet mix of soil and water, and we put it here on this uh, this dog glue. I mean, our special high, highly specialized um, soil blocking platform, or the bottom of a dog glue. And we squish it down on there. It has to be a lot wetter than what I'm doing right now. And then we put it in the tray and we press them out. And there's our little blocks. Um, so, that, so that's a soil block, and what's nice about that is now we got a really nice little um, uh, independent plant uh, growing uh, cell that doesn't require a bunch of plastic, which we like, and also has more soil in it than most plastic trays would have. So, uh, so that means it's got a little more, um, um, what's the right word, it's got a little more uh, uh, space to grow, which gives us a, uh, some leeway when we get them transplanted out, because as you can see, Things like those sunflowers over there and some other stuff that would have got, liked to go on the ground weeks ago. And it's been too, too cool and wet to put them out. Yeah. So you've got multiple piles of compost forming on your land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why do you need to supplement with Great question. bot? So why are we buying instead of making? Um, the main reason was when we made our own, our results were very erratic. So this is, each of these is about a $400 investment, each of these, ba these big bags. But if you look at what they're going into, it's literally, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of future produce. So a $400 investment in a consistent product is, to me, a really good investment. And it took me several years to come, well, a number of years to come around to that. But what would happen would be we'd mix something up and it would look just like the stuff we had mixed up the week before or two weeks before and we would pot stuff into it or soil block and this batch would do poorly and the previous batch had grown great. And so now you've got you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of plants that are, that are off to a bad start. And, um, and those, those, you know, if, let's say it's lettuce. And let's say we have a thousand lettuce plants that are that are now kind of peaky and unhappy. Um, even if we manage to limp those things through, and that may mean you know giving them some extra fertilizer, or fer uh, fertigating them something with fish emulsion, and then when we transplant them out, they're going to grow more slowly and so on. Uh, we're going to lose a certain portion of those to disease and pests because a weak plant draws disease and pests to it. And so eventually, it's a real false 
way to save money, right? Because that thousand heads of lettuce was going to be four thousand dollars worth of produce. Um, I should have just spent the four hundred dollars. <laughs> I mean, and even that a thousand heads of lettuce, with a thousand lettuce plants would only take uh, you know ten dollars worth of potting soil. So. so you use purchased compost or soil in the beginning, right? Yes. Okay. So then, once everything goes out in the field. Now then you use your yes. okay partly because the soil is much more forgiving so if I screw up my compost a little bit or there's something a little off it's not nearly as big a deal but in here when you're starting well I look at it it's very much like human babies right it's the same idea like we're just really careful what we feed babies and we should be right because they're delicate and we don't want to kill them you know when your 16 year old comes to you you're like yeah check it I don't know if it's good or not try it once you tell me how's it taste to you <laughs> we don't do that with babies right yeah. so so that's kind of the, that's the spirit of this thing. It's like, when we can, we want to give them the maximum attention. Because when we put them out in a cold, hard world, it's going to be rough out there. So yeah, so this is, that's why we buy our potting soil. Uh, great question. And then just one more time, because I always get confused, because I think people call everything compost, right. but then I don't know. So do you refer to one of these as topsoil and the other as compost or? So um, compost itself is decomposed organic matter. So compost can come from a variety of feedstocks, but it's it, in itself, it is just decomposed organic matter. So you start with manure, and you can decompose it until it's compost, at which point it won't have much of a smell, it'll have different texture, and so on. But potting soils are very rarely just compost. In fact, a lot of potting soils don't have any compost in them at all. A lot of them are just peat moss, with a little bit of nutrients mixed in and oftentimes some perlite or vermiculite, which is what you're seeing here. This white is perlite. And the reason they put those in is it helps aerate a little bit and it also, um, uh, it does hold some water. It'll, it'll soak up some water, kind of like a little sponge. Um, now this is a, this is a compost based potting mix. So it has compost, but then it also has uh, peat moss and it also has some coconut core and you can see just kind of little, uh, little small strands, and that's what those are. They're not horse hairs. They are actually coconut shell things, husks. Anyway, um, the goal is to create a mix that is aerated enough that the roots can breathe, because roots breathe. Um, that'll hold the moisture uh, enough that the seeds are going to germinate, and the roots are always going to have access to water. But that also is aerated enough that it won't drown. Uh, you can drown baby plants. It's actually uh, most people tend to overwater baby plants more than underwater, and then we'll talk about that when we get the water. But but having a good aerated mix to start is important. So I don't know if that answered it quite. So then, compost is usually a component of potting soil. Okay. Potting soil itself refers specifically to something that is being used to grow something in a pot or a container or somewhere. Um, no, not to say that you can't put potting soil in your garden, but that's not a common use for it. Most of the time, people are going to put it in a, in a container and grow something in that potting soil. Um, and then germination mix is a subset of potting soil that is super fine and be, you know, the best case scenario for starting, especially small seeds. Now, I, like, I'd start a melon in this, wouldn't have any trouble at all. Um, I'd start you know, cucumbers or anything like that. But if I'm going to do little, little flower seeds especially or lettuce or things like that, then the germination mix is really, really superior to that. Is the germination mix also like sterilized? Yes, it's also less, like that. yeah, um, so ours is not actually sterile because it's compost based, which is where those two diverge, really. Yeah. If you have a compost based potting soil, it's not sterile, but hopefully the things that are in it are mostly good. And um, yeah, so remind me to come back to that here in a second, we'll talk about damp off, okay? okay. Um, let me, I need to check my time to make sure, oh yeah, we're doing good, okay. All right, so media, um, any other questions about media? Um, when you're using the stuff in the field, are you using mainly compost, or are you doing like a ratio of that with topsoil? Compost. Yeah, all my stuff, all my additions in the field are compost. The stuff that we're yeah. making compost. Yes, yeah, our compost. We do sometimes top dress with city compost. I love the idea of having a diversity of compost, because every compost is made out of different feedstocks, has different bacteria and fungus in it. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of overlap there, but every time you bring in somebody else's compost, you're going to get a little bit of a diversity. I think that's really valuable for your growing. Um, but yeah, it, it field addition, you know, anything in the field is pretty much going to be compost, and most of it's the stuff we're making. Um, 
in our greenhouses, we'll add our compost to the beds, but we, right now, and this is interesting, Anna, that, so I am really interested in making my own potting soil. I think it's a really fun and interesting project, and, and I enjoyed doing it when we did it, but I also got to the point where we were having enough failure, partly because our crew grew big enough that we didn't have enough oversight to be sure that people were always mixing it consistently, and partly because then that's not just like having directions, it's partly knowing what it should feel like and smell like and those kinds of things. It's kind of hard to quantify that stuff. But uh, once you once you get it, you're like, oh, that's that's really nice potting soil. Yeah, that's perfect. And, but if you've got somebody who's just learning how to garden, that doesn't mean much to you. So it's nice that we have this really, you know, relatively reasonable stuff that uh, we can get delivered to us. Okay, any other media questions? Did you talk much about why you're planting into different things Container size and block size, that sort of thing. Yeah, you just yeah. talked about the blocks, you didn't yeah. talk about. Yeah, so the primary reason why I would choose different sizes, there's two things. One is seed size. I'm not going to put a watermelon in a block this size, right? It's, I mean, it's just not going to work. Um, and the, but the, the more common issue is how long are they going to be in the soil block? You know, how big is the plant going to get? If you're going to grow a sunflower like those on the top rack, those need to be in bigger blocks. I, there's just no way that I'm going to get uh, a, you know, a a good sized sunflower to grow this crowded in the small soil space. Um, whereas like a lettuce plant, I want to put a lettuce plant out at um, not a lot bigger than this, you know? And so that's fine. I'd make a fine lettuce transplant. Um, the other thing I'm going to consider is how many of them am I growing? You know, I, if I'm growing, uh, if I'm transplanting beets, I'm going to have to grow a lot of beet seedlings. I need them to be, I need them to be as small as I can reasonably grow them. You know, pot, the, the soil I'm using, I need that to be as small a space as possible because they're just going to take up a ton of space. I mean, a, a bed of, of uh, beets at five rows per bed and uh, a plant every four inches is like uh, 3,000, no, not quite that, but 1,500 beets. That's, that's a lot. I have a lot of trays. Um, a lot of growth space. A lot of growth space. And this tray fits 110 uh, of these soil block, the little soil blocks, but only 50 of the big soil blocks. So I would have to have twice as many trays. So, so that's another consideration. So as a general rule, then, if it's got a big seed, or if it's going to be in the soil for in the, in the uh, greenhouse for more than four weeks, I'm likely going to put it up in a bigger block. If it's going to be kind of a four-week grow out, then that's probably going to go in the smaller blocks, and. Uh, or if it's a tiny seed, that often you know, would, would allow me to put it in a small block as well. Or you'll start with this and then transplant up once you see the healthy plants. Depending on also, plants. very good point. Yeah, so sometimes, uh, and you can see that with the straw flowers, the germination was pretty poor. Um, if we have plants that we know, like Lysianthus is a classic example of something that germinates really poorly. Um, we'll just actually, we'll just make a tray of soil and we'll just sprinkle those on top. And then as they come up, we'll, what's called pricking out. So you, you take a little, tiny little, uh, you know, like a, a popsicle stick or something, you dig one out, and you stick it into a, uh, a little pot. And it grows tedious off. Little plants, Very tedious. <laughs> but, um, but well worth doing, because otherwise if you put one seed in every pot, even if you put two seeds in every pot, you're going to have a lot of empty pots, and that's a lot of wasted space. So. Yeah. Good, good question. Um, I'll make a quick note of the importance of labeling. Label, 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 label. Um, it's very frustrating to have mystery plants. We always have them, but it's very frustrating. Um, and those are really great. Those are Venetian blinds. You know, somebody taking out your blinds, there's a good chance you'll have a lifetime supply of, of plant tags if somebody gives you their Venetian blinds. With a wax pencil. Yeah, wax pencil. That's another important thing. China marker, they call it, or wax pencils. Um, because... Uh, Sharpies fade. Who knew? And you have mystery plants. You <laughs> had lots of mystery plants. One year we had all mystery plants. Because <laughs> the Sharpie faded. Um, and we've used wooden popsicle sticks, and those are cute, but they fade really bad, and they also bleed really bad, so I don't like them much. Um, but these, these are really good. This is a good system. Um, and plus, you know, you're reusing something that was already headed to the dumpster. I have this theory, I haven't tested it yet, that like at Lowe's and Home Depot and other places where they sell Venetian blinds, they probably have piles of this stuff just sitting around. Because don't they cut those yeah, to links? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? So there's got to be like, I haven't gone looking yet. You beat me to it. 
bring me a couple hundred. They went from way too fast. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's what that that's uh, the media issue. So you want to you want to pick a media that's going to do what you want it to do. Um, you want seeds that are going to do what you want them to do. You got to have a plan to get get all that together. Um, and now we're out here. We got our plan. We got it sorted by date, transplant date. I mean, a seed date. Um, and so now we're working our way through this through the plan and uh, putting uh, seeds into soil, which is where we want to be. So now, what are we going to do with those seeds to make sure that they actually thrive in our uh, in our greenhouse? Well. One of the challenges we had for years, and you guys will all be familiar with this, you've started plants, is getting that right environment, so right moisture, right temperature. Um, most plants want to germinate around 70 degrees. There's lots of exceptions to that, but you know, most plants, 70, 75, is wherever they want to be, and pretty close to 100% humidity for germination. Um, so the kind of classic home solution, and we did this for years, is the dome, the little humidity dome, and a heat mat, um, or overhead lights. Overhead lights are tricky because they can overheat it really fast and you don't know what's happening. Um, the, the thermostatically controlled heat mat's a nice solution. Are you guys familiar with that one? Has anybody used one of those? Yeah, those, are, those are really nice. Uh, they don't have a great lifespan, unfortunately. If you get five years out of them, you're doing pretty good. So kind of budget it that way. But, uh, but they do a really great job because they control the temperature and they keep bottom heat, which is really where you want the heat coming from, up through the soil. And, uh, and you get really good germination that way. Of course, on our scale, having heat mats, I mean, we'd have to have, I don't even know how many heat mats, a lot. So what we have instead is uh, we have, uh, first off for germination, we have this germination chamber. Don't be fooled, it is, it might look like an old glass reach-in refrigerator. But what it actually is, is a germination chamber because it no longer refrigerates. And so we have a little heater down in the bottom. We have a fairly expensive thermostat um, cheap heater, expensive thermostat, and that's what that is up in the top left corner there. And we have that set for 75 degrees, and we have a, therm a thermometer to kind of check that every once in a while too, and make sure it's actually what it's doing. And uh, we put those, tra we put any tray that we grow in there. Push it, open the door and look in there. Yeah, I don't know if there's anything in there right now, but yeah, just shelf after shelf, right? So we'll set those trays on there, on the shelves. And uh, at 75 degrees, most things will germinate about as quickly as they possibly can. So uh, when I say how, how as quickly as they possibly can, I should mention that like there's a wide range there, right? So if you look at the germination rate for spinach, um, or the germination uh, time for spinach, spinach can take as long as 60 days to germinate at like 34 degrees, or as little as five days at 75 degrees. So that's worth finding the right space to put it in, right? Mm -hmm. Because the one, you're not even sure if you really planted spinach anymore by the time it comes up. <laughs> I don't know. Um, peppers, tomatoes, eggplant, all those things really like that warm temperature to germinate. Makes a big difference. When we get our peppers to pop in about seven days, we're out. When we didn't have that space, when we keep them out in the greenhouse, even though it's the greenhouse and it's warm in the daytime and it gets cool at night, they would take we, uh, you know, uh, two weeks to germinate out here. In there, they're going in seven days. Um, so I really like that, like germination heat. Whether it's a heat mat or a germination chamber like this, you know, you can do a germination chamber with almost any sort of insulated container, um, just a little heater and a good thermostat. The goal is to keep it that 70 to 75 degrees and 100% humidity. Now, important thing, as soon as they pop, meaning as soon as they start growing anything other than a seed, you got to get them out of there, right? Because there's not enough light in there. This is the downside of a germination chamber, is it's dark. And um, even with the glass front on it, all that does is just guide those little seedlings to grow toward them. <laughs> so if we miss it, and this happens, you know, more than I'd like to admit, uh, then what happens is we end up with plants that have like this long, long stem and a tiny little cotyledon leaves out at the end. And that's usually not a good thing. I mean, they, 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 sometimes they'll recover, but more often than not, we just have to restart at that point. So we got to check the germination chamber daily. Um, to move stuff out of that and onto the seedling table. So uh, that is a good chance to segue, stretch our legs a little bit, and step over to the seedling table, and we'll take a look at that. Why don't we, uh, why don't you guys kind of file down this way, and I'll go down this way so I can look across at you. And, and because we're getting a little bit root bound. Right? These would have liked to have been out two weeks ago. Um, that's when we would have liked to put them out. Our guideline for potting up, um, moving plants up into the next size, 
is when they start holding hands. Um, so, for example, this basil right here. Um, they're getting big enough that they're starting to touch leaves. We call it holding hands, right? That tells us that that's probably also happening at the root level. It's time to move them up to a bigger container or move them out into the field, one or the other. Um, other plants, you know, like this lettuce, um, you know, it's still got a little space to go. It'll be okay to go a little bit bigger before we need to do something with it. So, uh, so that's what we're looking for in terms of what, what we're planting or what, how we're, um, what they're growing in and how, when we need to move them up. These sad tomatoes here needed to go out in the field uh, four weeks ago. They're, they're just kind of struggling here because they're not, they just hasn't been tomato planting weather <laughs> outside. A couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, when, are you going to thin out the basil when they hold hands? So these guys are in pots, uh, I'm sorry, oh. in soil blocks. Okay. So I'll plant each, uh, oh, I each, see. Mm -hmm. the, each one. Close. Yeah. Yeah, they are really, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, that's a great way because then, so we are, we'll end up with basil in three inch pots like that for sale, yeah. or we'll put them in, in the ground. But, um, you know, we can get almost uh, what this would be about half of a hundred foot bed worth of basil in this little tiny tray. Or if we planted it in the three inch pots initially, of course, it would take up five times as much space or more. So. My second question is mm -hmm. like with the unseasonable weather, yeah. uh, at what point is a point too far for starter plants? Yeah. Because we have some yeah. squash plants and yeah. some are still looking okay. Summer squash are some of the hardest. They, you know, squash and cucumbers, all the cucurbits, really don't like to get too big. In this. And I've got the same problem. You can see I've got a couple trays of squash mm -hmm. here that are just, I don't think they'll be worth planting now. You don't so think any of these will be worth planting? The squash. Okay. The squash one. There's big squash there. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to plant those. Now there's some smaller ones over on the left that we'll probably put out um, if we get a chance this week because it's looking like the weather's finally stabilizing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, once they get, I mean, really on the squash and cucumbers, I would like to put them out when they get their first true leaves. I don't want them to, I don't want them to outgrow their block at all mm -hmm. because uh, messing with their roots really stunts them. And I've tried it a lot of times because I always think, oh, I've got these big, beautiful squash plants. And they look really nice right now, but I know from experience that as soon as I tease them out away from their, all the, all the things that their roots are attached to, mm -hmm. it's just going to damage them and they're going to, they're going to. They don't die, they just don't grow. Yeah. It's really weird, and I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly what causes that, but I know it is the case. So, on the on the plus side, it's not too late to start more squash. So that's mm -hmm. good news. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the heat continues here. Of course, we've got ambient heat. We have a wood-fired furnace. We have uh, a, uh, a propane furnace. But we also have on this table. If you look at the table, you'll see these little black. Well, they're kind of gray. Uh, rubber tubes, and those circulate hot water. They're not on right now, but um, it circulates water through them, and so this table is, the surface of the table is kept at about 80 to 85 degrees, and that means that the soil is in the 70s most of the time when, it's, when the table's on, and that really speeds up our growth early season. That's why it's off right now, because we're trying to kind of slow things down a little bit until we can get stuff out in the field. But uh, when we started using bottom heat, which is what this is called, heat coming up from the bottom. Uh, when we started using bottom heat, we actually had to, we, we were able to shave three weeks off the planting time of our tomatoes. Or, so, meaning like we had been planting them in, in the second week of January, we were able to move them to the second, uh, first week of February, our actual seed date, because they grew so much more vigorously. And not just because they grew faster, but also healthier. Um, having that warmth coming up from below really helps with fungal disease and bacterial disease, um, keeps the plants really vigorously growing, which is also good for uh, keep helping them defend themselves from pests and disease and things like that. So bottom heat's nice. Um, you know, in a, in a household scale, that heat mat is something you can continue to use, or you can just make sure they're in a really nice warm place. You know, that one of the uh, a windows great, but you want to watch windows because they have a kind of a cold air cascade coming down them if it's, you know, if it's cold season. And so you think they're in the nice sunny warm window, but maybe they're actually getting kind of a cold air cascade on them all the time. And that, that can be a problem. Uh, let's talk a little bit about moisture control. So obviously you don't want to underwater your plants because that will kill them, but overwatering them will kill them just as much. So how do we manage for that in this scale? And then how would you translate that to home? 
So uh, we have an automated watering system, the sprinkler system overhead. It uh, goes on once a day right now. It'll, and as the season heats up, it'll be more than once a day. But right now it's once a day. And it goes for about eight minutes. It's kind of a fogger, so it's a fairly small amount of water coming out. But it is over the space of the table. It's quite a bit. And, uh, and that's enough to do, on a day like today, it was all the water they wanted. Other than maybe these sad tomatoes here. But everything else had plenty of water. Um, on a sunny day and, or breezy day like we had you know, several of over the weekend, that'll only be about half the water they need. So I need to come in and either start the water cycle again, or more often I'll just come through with a water wand and top up with a water wand. So kind of watching for what's, what's, big, uh, what's drying out and what's not. Uh, one of the tricky things with seedlings is they need widely divergent amounts of water. So when you get a big tomato plant or a squash plant or cucumber plant that's got a lot of uh, leaf space, it's transpiring a whole bunch of water out into the, into the greenhouse all the time. And so it's drying up faster than these tiny little lettuce plants are going to, right? Um, not because of the mass of soil, but because of the mass of leaf that's totally pulling that moisture out. So we want to watch that. And that, that's why we always, even with the overhead watering, I still always still have to come through every day and, and manually water a little bit, or at least monitor and make sure we're not getting too dry anywhere. Uh, on the other end, if we get too wet, why is it set to do only 80 or 90 percent of the water, or even 50 percent? Because I do, I do want the soil to dry out, and that's not happening today because it was just not a day when anything dried. But generally, we would like to see the the larger containers. We'd like to see their surfaces be a little bit dry this time of day, and that would tell us that we were kind of breaking that um, that fungus cycle. So fungus can only really thrive in a wet environment. And so, uh, or this kind of fungus, and uh, and so this is a this is a way for us to stop that. So I, I mentioned that word before, damp off. And I'm sure if you've grown very many seedlings, you guys have seen this at some point. But you got this little health, healthy little seedling, or a whole bunch of them, and all of a sudden they just start keeling over, and it looks like they just turn to almost like uh, jelly. The stem turns to jelly, and they just fall over. That's damp off. Uh, it's a. Uh, I said a fungus earlier. Now I think about it, I'm not actually sure it's a fungus or a bacteria whatever the case it thrives in that wet environment so this, this the simple solution to damp off is you have to let the surface of the plants dry off at least every couple days so that they don't build up that uh, that fungus and, and then get their t stems attacked so the fans are part of that as well we have two fans on on this side of the greenhouse and two fans on that side so the air is constantly circulating in here and that helps things dry out which, again, the whole point of that is to cut that fungal cycle. Um, and, uh, but that also allows us to do, you know, to water enough and still get it to dry out. So it's this, uh, it's this balance point. Okay, so we talked about media, warmth, water. All right, now we're going to talk about hardening off. Okay, so our babies are ready to go out. Uh, our soil is ready or getting close. What are we going to do to sort of ease the transition from in here, this cushy environment where everything they could ever want is supplied to them. They've got warm toes, they've got a drink, every, you know, whatever they need it. Um, we need to stress them a little bit because up until this point, they've been cranking out the growth as fast as they can grow. We need to gently apply the brakes and say, ease up. If you do that out in the real world, you know, initially, you're gonna have problems because if we stick these guys out and they're just still growing great, uh, you know, full speed ahead, then what happens is they get stunted or they can even be damaged by the sun, um, sun and wind combination. So what we do in our case is these racks that you see here, um, we move all of our plants that are gonna go out in the next week, we put them on the hardening off rack and we roll them out in the daytime, we roll them back in at night. And that's kind of a way to give them like a little shot of the outside. Um, if it's gonna be a really uh, hot sunny day, we may put a tray over the top of them so they have a little bit of shade. Uh, if it's going to be too windy, we might pull them in a little bit so they just kind of get a little wind and not too much. But we're paying attention to them. It's like, it's kind of like a toddler at this point, right? We're going to like, yeah, hey, you got a little more freedom, but we're, we're still keeping an eye on you. Um, and that, that really has made a big difference. For years, we had a uh, much higher seedling transplant fatality rate than we would like to have seen. And hardening off cut that in half. It really, really made a big difference. Hardening off is a scary and frustrating task because it is this daily thing. You're moving things in and out. So wheels and concrete were the solution for us. That's why we have that concrete slab out there. Um, 
And then we've also done some, when we have a whole lot of plants that need to go out soon, we've done some, put them out on the, uh, on the slab and just make sure we water them several times a day. And that's sort of, it's not quite as good as moving them in at night, but once the temperature's above freezing, it does work okay. Um, and what we're still doing, we're still kind of coddling them by making sure they have as much moisture as possible um, as, as they can use. And, but we're still letting them experience sun and wind. And also my hardening off slab has a big tree on the west side. So they do get some afternoon shade, which kind of keeps them from getting too, sun, too much sun too quick. Um, which is crazy, right? We think of plants, they love sun. Absolutely true. But anywhere, anytime you're growing something inside, you probably have exposed it to a lot less light than it's going to get out in the open. So that's what you're doing. You're just helping it adjust to the new conditions. Uh, so that's what hardening off is all about. Right. If we know that there's that we're going to be, I mean, if they're if they are cool weather crops like broccoli and kale and things, we'll leave them out, not below freezing, but we'll leave them out any night that's not below freezing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then the other thing that I didn't really mention, but in our transition there, we also will be really careful about when we put them out. So which is part of why we're looking at so many seedlings here. But we don't want to put them out if we got a freeze coming in the next two days. We want them to be out there for a little while before they experience that. We won't put them out if uh, it's going to be like super, super windy. That's just asking for trouble. And of course, we try and avoid putting them out right before big rains, things like that. So, you as well. want to give them a few days where they're having nice weather to get a little bit established before anything really hard hits them. That's what we really and want. And you don't really want anything really hard, just like right. on the edge, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, if we have, if we can't achieve that, if we get up in a bind on time and we just have to get them out there, then the other thing we can do is put row cover over them. And that does, and we'll often do that this time of year anyway, because it really eases that transition. It's kind of like a, you know, a, a, a uh, it's like half a greenhouse, we could say, right? Still lets the air and the water through, but it does keep the, the wind off of them a little bit and, um, and keeps them a little bit warmer in the daytime as well. I hope this has been helpful today as we talked about seedlings and transplant production. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, check out our other videos. We've got quite a few videos online here on our YouTube channel. Uh, like and subscribe. And uh, check us out for future Twilight Walks as well. In the summertime, it's the third Wednesday of every month.